that racism is a white problem. Um, not because I think that white people are inherently racist or the only people who can be, but I think that there's a difference between structural racism, which inhibits people's life chances, and racial prejudice. I think people of all races can have racial prejudice, and I, there's examples of that in the book that I wrote. But I think that um, structural racism is prejudice, that comes from people who are in powerful positions to um, get in the way of your life chances. So in the book, I speak specifically about Britain and I speak about education, employment, housing um, and healthcare. And I look at the huge racial disparities within, you know, accessing those things that we all need, you know, school, job, healthcare, etc., etc. The huge racial disparities which being a British person, I have access to that data as a journalist because the government collects that data. And I can see quite clearly that um, along racial lines, if you are not white, you fare much worse in those institutions than if you are white. And so if there is this huge racial disparity um, and these are workplaces that seem to be overwhelmingly in the most senior positions populated by white people, then it would stand to reason that racism that inhibits people's life chances is a problem that white people need to solve ASAP. In 2014, I wrote a blog post called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, which I've since expanded into a book. And when I wrote that blog post, I was very, feeling very sad and pessimistic um, because every time I tried to speak to my white friends, colleagues, peers about racism, they told me that I was, it was all in my head. Um, and I really wanted to, at the time of writing that blog post, call attention to the absolutely crumbling sensation that you feel when you try to essentially confide into confide in someone that you trust and they tell you you're crazy <laughs> it's a very um, devastating experience and I think that being um, the, the, a child of the diaspora being somebody whose heritage is in an African country that was once a Britain British colony being a person who lives in a, in a country that was a former empire um, that literally tried to take over many parts of the world, that many of us who are people of colour living in countries that were once former empires can very much, um, I suppose, resonate and really identify with that feeling of, you know, hundreds of years later, um, there feels like there is justice unresolved and that, you know, part of the the task of colonial empire, whether it was um, intentional or not, was to advance ideas of white supremacy. Like, and that happened in countries in Western Europe that advanced their ideas around the globe. And I would say that 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 deconstructing white supremacy is is a long and arduous task that's probably going to take as long. A, uh, to deconstruct as it was to be enforced. Um, I think that's something that we all have to take on a responsibility for if we no longer want to live in a world that um, is essentially complicit in white supremacy. I think when I was four years old, I had more awareness than I realised that um, there were racial stereotypes um, that sort of decided if one person was good and one person was bad, one person was worthy, one person was unworthy, um, that were sort of being transmitted to me amongst the media that I read and watched. And, and I don't think that me asking my mum when I was four or five years old, when will I turn white, it wasn't an original thought. It was something that as an avid reader and an avid like, watcher of television, I had just consumed so many images of whole human beings with complex personalities as white. And I'd received so many images of people who are not white as villains or the butt of the joke that I was like, well, I'm a full, complex, interesting human being. And those people only are white. So I will eventually turn white as that is what humanity looks like. And I think that's a terrible, terrible shame that at four years old, I had already internalized that message. If you've only seen people on television when you're young who are not white, who are robbers, <laughs> then when you're walking down the street and you see someone who's not white, you start to clutch your purse, yeah. which creates 
an absolute nightmare then for real life. The thing about white privilege um, and, you know, having this like bounteous representation of humanity um, that's only of white people is that it sort of creates not only an, an advantage for those people but also they don't even realise that they've got it. It's just the norm. It's literally just the norm and that's what I really mean by white privilege is having a, uh, a subtle advantage that you're not even very aware of. But I also relate it to myself, you know, I'm somebody who's university educated I'm not disabled um, and I have advantages as a result of that. There's an anecdote in the book where I write about um, only realising that so many areas in the UK were totally inaccessible for disabled people when I had wheels to carry around myself, which was my bicycle. And it had never occurred to me before. I was just skipping up the steps without a care in the world, thinking this was just totally normal. And then suddenly when I had wheels to carry around, I said, this is terrible. This status quo, this structure is absolutely terrible. It's excluding so many people. So I think that, you know, privilege and like subtle, quiet advantage um, affects us all in very different ways. And of course, if you're not benefiting from it, then you can't see it. But I mean, you can see it a lot more clearly. And similarly, you know, if you are benefiting from it, then for you, it's just normal. And that's what I mean. I don't mean, oh, I live in the lap of la luxury. I wear designer clothes and I'm, you know, fed grapes by servants. That's not what I mean when I'm talking about privilege.